and uh, the Lord just gave me an analogy, and I want it to be real practical. I'm looking around the room, and I know a lot of people here are still working out in the workforce, and uh, you know, we come into church, and, and it's a wonderful atmosphere with all our other Christian brothers and sisters, and you know, we hear great testimonies, and then we go to work on Monday morning, and it might not be the most uh, sanctified space, except that you're there, and when you're there, um, that's, that's a real good sign, because uh, that means you bring the anointing with you, and I don't know if you've noticed th this, uh, what I'm about to say, but God will, will, will open up opportunities for you to talk to people during the day, and um, I've, I've heard it referred to as a sliding door moment, okay, and the initial reference that I heard was uh, from a psychologist who was uh, brilliant at helping marital relationships. And, and he talked about how it, with your spouse, um, there'll be a bid for connection, right? One of the spouses will want to start a conversation and the other one might, might be hurt over something that happened and, and kind of give the cold shoulder. And we don't want to, we don't want to reject the bid for connection when, when someone comes. And, and if there is that little bit of a chill, once in a while, there'll be a sliding door moment where there'll be a point of vulnerability where you can go in and, and walk through that door of opportunity and, and talk to your spouse. And, and the man that was uh, telling the story said that the circumstance was that he was reading a novel and um, he, he wasn't ha hadn't had an argument with his wife or anything, but she was in the bathroom getting ready for bed. It was at night and, and he was really anxious to finish this mystery novel. Uh, but he knew he had to brush his teeth, so he, he ran in the bathroom to brush his teeth real quickly so he could go back and finish the novel. But he just got a prompting to look over at his wife, and, and he, she didn't say anything, but she was brushing her hair, and he could just tell because they had been married a long time that she was very sad. And instead of asking a question, all he did was walk over behind her and take the brush out of her hand and just brush her hair because he saw that sliding door open, didn't have to say a word, but it was a heart-to-heart -heart thing that she knew that he could sense something was up, and without language, he just did an act of intimacy with her. And then she was much more open to talking about what was bothering her, right? So, I mean, that's not real complicated, is it? But it's being present to the moment. That's a phrase I'll use a lot tonight. It's not really a Bible specific Bible phrase, but we want to be alert in the spirit. And, and being awakened is said often, right? And, and being seduced and being, having a slumbering spirit is, is spoken of often in the Bible and not being seduced by spirits. And, um, you know, what about the man that was in that pigsty? He came to his senses. He was awakened out of that slumber, that fog in his brain that was sending him in the wrong direction and he was making all kinds of bad decisions. What is that awakening? It's a prompting of Holy Spirit. If we are alert to it, right? And people are losing their interpersonal skills in our culture, especially the young people. They they're got constantly have their heads down, staring into their phones. Now I know some of you read your Bible on your phone, so if you have your, phone, your Bible open, that's okay. But like you walk in restaurants and people aren't even looking at each other. They're not talking to each other. The teachers are reporting, some of the teachers that have been in it for 40 years, that children get tested every year. And they've been doing the same test for like 60, 70 years. And there's consistent scores when they ask children to take a certain test on what expression a person has on their face. And they're failing these tests. They don't even know how to read the, the responses of other, on other people's faces. So I'm going to tell you, this is a really important topic, this idea of the sliding door moment and, and not even counting what I already talked about, how much chaos and confusion there is in the world and how people just kind of are at their wit's end. Now, you know the enemy would want you to be emotionally hijacked, right? And you think about your life as, as the cockpit of a plane and there's a terrorist in that, in that cockpit you're not going to fly to the right destination, are you? And if your emotions are hijacked like that, you're not going to make good decisions. And it's really hard to hear from the Lord when you're in that state. When, uh, when John Paul Jackson was here before he passed, uh, he was here many years ago, and he coined a phrase, I believe, it was, he said that peace is the potting soil of revelation. Okay, brilliant that you hear from the Lord clearly when you're centered on him. 
and you're not upset and you're not making up stories in your head of what you're going to say to that person that you're so mad at, right? Anybody else do that besides me? But you have to catch yourself and say, no, no, wait a minute. The battle belongs to the Lord. This isn't my vengeance that has to come in here. So that's all I'm saying in the title here is, is don't miss God's sliding door moments because they happen every day. People are making a bid for connection to you. They're sending a little signal that they'd, they'd like to talk, but they don't know how to talk about it. Maybe they're a little awkward, and, and they're hoping that you'll see that, see that signal that they're sending. And, and when you're bathed in the Holy Spirit and you're bathed in the Word of God and you're, and you're asking Him to help me know what to say, when I open my mouth, Lord, you fill it. This is what the relationship with Holy Spirit does for us, right? It's not that He comes and goes. He's always with us. But well, we don't yield to him, then we walk right past all these opportunities. And I have to just tell you, it's not a small thing. Because God is asking us to be involved with him. He could just do it all himself, right? But he said, no, I'm going to co-labor with you. Just as Adam and Eve corrupted the whole process, I want my people, the body of Christ in the earth, to uncorrupt it. To bring the kingdom into everyday life, including on your job, and including in places where it might not be appropriate to specifically bring out your Bible and, and give them the sinner's prayer. That's not the point. The point is, how can God bring redemption into their situation? And if you don't listen well, you're not going to know. So let's just look at the text verses from Esther chapter 4. You might remember when Mario Marilla was here, this is the verse I used to describe him as, as, as the person who's here for such a time as this, right? It's a famous verse in Esther, and this is the Amplified Version. It says in verse 13 of Esther 4, Amplified Version, then Mordecai told them to re reply to Esther, right? So that was her uncle. She couldn't talk to him directly. She was in the palace, but she sent a message, and, and Mordecai said, okay, when you go back, this is what you tell her. Don't you imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, can we just stop there, church? There's a really close governor's race right now. I didn't even know. I checked it before I got here, but it was still too close to call, right? If every church in New Jersey had not remained silent about this election, do you think it would have swung the vote? It's looking like a couple thousand votes are going to make a difference, right? But if we keep silent because we have this twisted thinking that somehow what we think is the most important thing in our lives is our relationship with God should not be talked about related to the culture. That's not even New Testament biblically accurate. That was the big threat of the church was that they were trying to have a different king. Guess what? You have a different king. You're a Christian. You have a different king. And you follow the rules of that kingdom. We don't want to openly violate the laws, but if they're un unlawful laws, if they're unconstitutional laws, then yes. Right? I mean, if you're willing to let them decide what your kids are taught in school, something's really wrong. What could be more precious than the curriculum for five-year-olds? That's why the governor of Virginia lost F for an insane thing that he said in a debate. I don't know, maybe you're aware of this. It also just happened last night, too. I mean, I don't, I don't want to go too far into it other than the practical side of this is that if you don't stand up for your kids, don't expect somebody else to. So you go to the school board meeting, you make that, that statement of that, that is every bit you're right. It's our taxes that are going to pay for this. And they're not cheap in New Jersey, are they? So this governor, during the debate, the, the incumbent governor said that we don't want the parents telling us what we should be teaching their children in school. Boom, done. Game over. Big turnout. He lost. And, and everybody knew that, that, was the, that was the tipping point. Don't mess with my kids. If you can't get upset about that, then I don't know, man. Something's really wrong. So he said, go ahead, Esther. You want to remain silent? Go ahead. <laughs> if you remain silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish what since you did not help when you had the chance. And this is where the backbone comes in. This is where the courage comes in of being a Christian. This is where Paul led the way for us as a model of somebody who was beaten and 39 stripes multiple times, spent the night shipwrecked at sea. I mean, like again, Energizer Bunny, like no quit. That's what all Christians are supposed to be. That's, that's an example. Jesus is, is the example, but Paul's an awfully good apostle for us to look at. 
And then he says the, the verse that's most quoted in Esther 4.14, who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this and for this very purpose. So look, you know, again, like you have to decide how you're going to have to stand before the Lord and face him. And I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on anybody, but I am saying make that your prayer in the morning every day. Help me see the sliding door opportunities that you put before me and then give me the courage to step through that door. You know why? It's a sliding door. It's going to close. It doesn't just stay open all the time. And if that's what Mordecai said. If you don't do it, God will raise up somebody else to do it. And I'm not going to give you like an endless timeline here, right? And, and I believe the longer you're a Christian, the more he expects of us. It's, it's not the same as when you were a new Christian. It's not ever meant to just be kept only for us. It's meant for us to translate it into our everyday lives, including with our families. Um, another great door verse here, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 7. I do not wish to see you right now, Paul is saying. <laughs> Excuse me just in passing, but I hope to remain with you for some time later on, if the Lord permits. He's talking to the Corinthians, but he's referring in verse 8, he says, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, because what? A wide door for effective service has opened to me. See, that's that sliding door. Paul's even referencing to it. I see an opening here. I've got an opportunity. And then there's this you know, wonderful line. It's a very promising opportunity, but what comes with that? Say it. There's adversaries there, right? What about Esther? Did she have some adversaries? Better believe it. Haman got hung on his own gallows, but man, he was a pretty, pretty severe adversary. What about Nehemiah? Pretty severe adversaries. Every time you're trying to do a great work for the Lord, there's going to be opposition, either people or spiritual darkness over a certain region, right? So Haggai is another one of those prophets, and he has a, a wonderful expression that I like to refer to about the John the Baptist kind of anointing that, that many of us are supposed to have. If we walk into a situation and we know something's off, we, we have to have the authority, right? We don't just automatically tell everybody what they should do. If you don't have authority, you shouldn't, but often you do have the authority to say something. And, and this is what he says to them. Haggai is the prophet of Israel, and he goes in there. They had been given money to rebuild uh, the city and the temple. And it says, thus speaks the Lord. Uh, Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. The Lord of hosts saying, this people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and the temple lies in ruins? See what can happen? We can get our priorities misplaced. And in this particular case, they were afraid. They had been threatened by the enemy, so they took the money that the Lord gave them for the temple and they put it in their own houses. And, you know, I didn't give you all the verses here, but if you got them all, this is where he says, you, you put money in a bag, but it's got holes in it and it falls out the bottom, right? And <clears throat> I blow on the things that you bring me because you lost your priorities. And you can't lose your priorities as a Christian. You've got to stay centered on the main thing, right? It's time for you and yourself to dwell in paneled houses when the house of the, of the Lord lies in ruins. And then he says this wonderful expression, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Okay? You need courage to step through that sliding door that just opened for you. And you want to know that it's the Lord. And you might bump yourself into, you know, did you ever see somebody that was carrying something and they didn't realize the door to the patio was closed because glass was clean and they bounce off it? I don't know if it ever happened to you, but... Um, we've seen it happen a couple times. Like, if that ever happens, Trisha just loses it for, like, 20 minutes. It's something about slapstick humor to her. And it, whatever, I'll just tell you that it's nothing personal, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, so that, that's going to happen. There's going to be times that you, you think it was the Lord's opportunity, but you just didn't quite land the plane, right, with that three-point landing. But unless you're exercising these muscles, right, which is our job to help you try to, to recognize, man, he will meet you. He will meet you there when you offer yourself for the kingdom of God and the earth. It's not meant to just come to church, get filled up, go home, and then live in the bunker. Because it is very sinful. But, but God, right? But God. So here's a good example of somebody who stepped through open doors. And I like to use it almost as um, even just a teaching tool because... So many times, our, our logical mind 
especially if you have a logical type of job like an engineer or you know, people that, that are constantly having to solve for one perfectly right answer or the bridge collapses, right? Like, we're glad that we have those people out there. But it doesn't always work that way with faith, right? Faith is the substance of what you hope for, the evidence of what you haven't seen yet. So there's risk involved with faith. There's risk involved with stepping through an open door. And there was lots of risk for Esther, right? Like she could have died if it, if it went wrong. And her uncle's like, yeah, you're going to die anyway if you don't do something. So take your chance. Who knows? Maybe you're here for just such a time as this, king of kings. Maybe you're here for such a time as this in somebody's life. Let me tell you, one person gets changed. It's a lot more than one person, right? And I talked about that Sunday with uh, It's a Wonderful Life. You know, one guy takes it from Bedford Falls to Pottersville just because one guy was missing. So brilliant, right? Brilliant analogy of how important all of us are, but not the shut down version of us that's hiding. It's got to be the engaged version of us that's open. Courageous, really, is one of the best ways I could say it. So this man's courageous. It's Philip. He's not one of the apostles, but he's got a rank, right? He, he's a deacon in the early church, and it says, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. You believe angels still speak to people today? <laughs> Anybody ever had direction from God this way? Heard a voice, felt something, three different things confirmation of things that are happening and you know like you know that the Lord is, is showing you to do something right and he says arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza and many of many of us would be like okay what do you want me to do when I get there right that's not much of an instruction like why should I do that why what am I going to do when I get there he doesn't do that does he so we better be careful that we don't do that either. If you're getting the prompting and you recognize the voice, that's what Jesus said. My sheep know my voice, right? And, and the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So when you develop this ability to hear the Lord clearly, he didn't need anything else. Then he knew the Lord was speaking to him and said, just go down there. And there's this sense of risk like, oh, this is another adventure. I wonder what's going to happen. I know it's the Lord who told me to go down there, so something good's going to happen, right? And he arose and went. No additional language, no additional asking. He's like a soldier. Got the order, you go. Don't need to know why. And a man of Ethiopia, I'm sure a lot of you have read this portion of scripture. It's well known. A eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, and he was sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. What a coincidence <laughs> that God would tell him to go down there. Right place at the right time. Who knows? Dave Torres, that you're not here for such a time as this in that person's life. And still, Philip's like waiting. And then the Spirit said to Philip, right? So he had to go through part one first, and then he got part two. And often, when you're in a conversation with people, and you know the Lord lets you walk through that sliding door, you don't know the full conversation yet, right? But you start it. And in the going, in the getting into that conversation, he'll unfold more. And including, as they're speaking to you, they know you're listening to them because of the way you're responding. And we don't like it when people are not listening to us, right? Remember, just watch a little child. And they're acting out in real time what we're doing inside. <laughs> when we don't feel like we're being listened to, right? We get angry when we don't think people are listening to us. And then the Spirit of, of the Lord said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Still didn't say, why? Like, what am I going to do when I get there? No, come on. Let's not do that to God. This is part of learning the communication of the language of heaven. Um, one one um, commentator, scholar, he calls it, there's an interlocking between heaven and earth, right? It overlaps and it interlocks. And, and yes, when you're obedient to the Lord, you receive the blessing of protection, right? So because you're living within the boundaries of obedience to the word, you just get a natural immunity to bad stuff happening to you. Not that it never happens, but you avoid a lot of problems because you're not at a bar at 2 o'clock in the morning drunk, right? Just because you, you know that you're going to live within the boundaries of the word. But then there's this extra level of engagement where 
okay, Lord, I'm looking. Where's the open door that you want me to step through? And man, he loves that. I can tell you, he loves that. So I say it often, but I'm going to repeat it again because the people that he was the most upset with, Jesus was the most upset with the Pharisees, the priests, and the religious people. And I want to just say, in my life, I've learned that a religious spirit is not bound to church and, re and religion, you know, whether you're in a temple or a church or whatever. It could be anywhere, and it is everywhere. It's in uh, institutions, it's in corporations, it's you name it. It, it. it could be at the Little League game. I mean, I had so many fathers come up to me this fall saying, I can't believe the insane behavior that I witness at these Little League games. You, you were telling me too, right? I mean, just some, just out of control, anger, and what kind of model are you, are you sending your kid, right? And so, like, we just, I'm not trying to go off too far on a tangent, but we have to be really careful that we don't have a religious spirit. And if we're not willing to say to the Lord, show me those open doors so that I can walk through them, then, then we lose some of that edge, right? And I quote this other verse a lot too from Job, where it says, though a tree gets cut down at the scent of water, a bud will spring forth from that stump, even though it looks dead at the scent of water. That's how we're supposed to live our lives, where the spirit of the Lord is like that scent of water that I, that I smell and there's life. And that's what they smell when they're with you, your life, because you're not just locked into that old, well, it's just the way it is. That's the way God made me. Nothing we can do. What's, what's one vote going to do? Mm hmm you need this election right here to tell you. 1.2 million votes, and it was a 15,000 uh, 15, vote difference, with, still with 150,000 votes to go. That was before I left today to get here. So this, this is very sobering words. Matthew's ta uh, Matthew 21, Jesus is talking to the chief priests, right? These are supposed to be the, the paragons of the community, the people who know the Bible the best and who are living it and modeling it for the people, and they're not. They're missing the obvious thing. God is in their midst, and they can't see him because he's not in the form that they expect him to be. So we should really just be very careful that we don't do this, have a rigid mindset that God can only move a certain way. I remember during the revival in Toronto, one of the things was laughter. And, and, and it was a little awkward if you were in the meeting and people were just laughing like uncontrollably. And, and one, of, uh, one of the critics said, my God would never make people laugh like that. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Really? <laughs> come on. Like, how do you come up with that? Because this is what happens. We just get conditioned that it's only supposed to be a certain way. You go overseas and you watch what happens and, and people worship for hours and that they celebrate and, and they're just so grateful to God for being delivered and set free. And, and we have this comfortable academic version of Christianity that, that's not New Testament. So he said, surely I say to you, priests, the, the chief priests, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. Now, why wouldn't they have believed him? Because he didn't fit the box that they thought you had to fit into. And I'm not saying that there aren't times of people, right, there's excess sometimes when people think it's God and it might not be God. But that's not your judgment call. It would be our judgment call because we're the leaders here. And if we saw some people act in a certain way, it's just happened, we'd have to just put an arm around them and say, hey, you know, can we talk to you? Let, you know, call my cousin Vinny and he get, bring you in the back. <laughs> Just kidding. We never threaten violence. But uh, it's happened. It's not fun. But look, if, if you're going to allow people to grow in the gifts of the Spirit, it could be messy. That's just what happens. When you were learning how to ride a bike, did you learn the first time? I didn't. I remember the only thing that stopped me was a big set of bushes. <laughs> And how to use the brakes. So, bam, like right into the bushes. And my father didn't hit me for that, right? You get up and you do it again. And you try again. And you learn from that. So, we want people to learn how to grow in the gifts of the Spirit. And if it's not perfect the first time, it's okay. Nobody gets it perfect the first time. But, but our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and help you grow in these gifts and get some muscle memory, right? So, 
they uh, saw the same things that the unbelievers saw, yet they didn't believe. When you saw it, Jesus is saying to the, to the chief priests, you didn't afterward relent and believe him. Some did later, right? We know that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and he did relent, and he did believe. And he became one of the leaders in the early church. So it's, you know, it's not a hopeless cause, but you really need to recognize if there's a religious spirit in you and in me where we're tying God's hands because we think he would never do that. Well, be careful. I'm talking about God here, right? And this is uh, another sobering. I'm going to get out of the sobering verses soon, I promise. But in Luke 19, it says, as Jesus drew near to the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it, right? Now, there's not a lot of... Ex examples of Jesus weeping in the Bible. We know he wept at, uh, with Mary and Martha at the tomb of Lazarus, right, because they were grieving. But this is another time. And it's just like he's cresting over the hill as he's riding into the city, and he stops, and he just breaks down, weeping over the city. And he says, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, right, if you had just gotten out of that religious box and seen me for who I was. If you didn't have all the religious traps, the tax collectors and the harlots, they know they're sinners. They rapidly ran to me for an answer and received the answer, right? The first one to see Jesus, resurrected Jesus, is a woman that had seven demons cast out of her, not the paragon of the community, except God doesn't look at that stuff, does he? She went. And she saw, wow, it's amazing, isn't it? If only you had known the things that would make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes because they're behind this religious thinking. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. This happened in 70 AD, okay? Jesus was speaking this at the age of 33, so less than 40 years later, this exact thing happened. Rome took the whole city down, wiped them out. Why? There you go. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. So let's just focus on that one for a minute. What does that mean? You did not know the time of your visitation. God was in your midst, and he made himself real to many other people around you, and because you thought you knew everything, let's just say, you didn't accept it. And Whoa, big mistake. There was a sliding door moment, and you didn't step through, and the door closed because of a hard heart. Not just a religious spirit. I know I'm spending a lot of time on that. So um, get that video ready, but not yet. I'll tell you when. So recently, uh, was anybody here on that Friday night when Chuck Pierce and Joshua Giles spoke? And um, Chuck had a, an unusual evening, even for Chuck. <laughs> right? So... Uh, he met a lady, I'll just read one of these quotes. He said, on the way in, walking into the church tonight, I met a lady from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she said to him outside before the meeting started, I came all the way from Lancaster to hear you say something that I haven't heard you say on the web already. <laughs> so she stepped through an open door, right? She saw him, and she's like, dude, that's like a two and a half hour ride. She didn't say that, but that's the implication, like, don't just give me yesterday's manna. I came to hear a fresh word. And no, he, he's such a, a, what intuitive, prophetic person that's been doing this for so long because his gift is strong in this area. He was telling us, like, that challenged him. So he said right after that, Lord, I want you to answer that woman's prayer. I'm going to wait until I see you answer her prayer. Right now, I'm sure he had notes prepared and he was going to speak on a certain topic that night. Um, but he said, no, right? A little later, he said, I didn't plan to do any of this, so don't ask me what it means. <laughs> That's not my job tonight. My job tonight is just to tell you what's about to come and to start moving, all right? So I don't know if you remember this, but there were, uh, there were 10 different things that he listed, which I'll get to. So go ahead, just show that real quick. The next route was strange route. It said industrial, creative, remake. Industrial, creative, remake. The Lord says, get ready. 
from what was I meant to birth from this area that would change the world and how it got covered over, I say get ready, that root of industrial creative remake is now going to burst up through the land again. Some of you say, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do any of this. The Lord says, get on the root. Ride the root. If you'll ride the root, it'll give you new fruit. Say that out loud. If I'll ride the root, it will give me new fruit. So he didn't know, you know all the implications of what he was saying. That was only one of ten. If you go to that slide uh, that I have up there now, um, he, you know, and look, like I said, he comes and he says, here's this woman say, I want to hear you give a fresh word. He says, Lord, I want you to answer that prayer. So then when we're in the meeting, he, you know, while, during worship, he, he told us later, you know, because during worship he didn't break it into that, but he said, uh, and he, I saw an angel come in the room and he, had a key and he put the key in the ground and he opened it and all these roots started popping up and and he wrote down the names that he saw on the different roots okay and you could see that um online you know that service from that friday night the 24th so all i did was just read you uh or show you the clip for, for that one because while i was sitting in the seat and he was talking about that the lord prompted something to me of what that might have meant and I think it's really important that we do that. It's important that we go back to the prophetic words and, and we pray into them, like, what is that? What was that prophetic root that was lost? Because, again, like, the words were, what was here is now gone, right? I, don't, I didn't actually write it. Yeah, industrial creative remake. And the Lord was saying, what I meant to birth from this area that would change the world got covered over. I say, get ready the root of industrial creative remake is now going to burst up through the land again. So what could that have been, that thing that we lost, that he meant to change the whole world? And I don't know that I'm exactly right with what I'm about to say, but this is what, what prompted me. So I'll just give you a little bit, back, bit of background. I still work on, in, in finance, Wall Street world. I don't have to go there hardly at all anymore because I can work from here now, but in the finance world. And I was working at a big Wall Street firm at the time, and I was in charge of running this particular meeting where this man was the guest speaker, Walter Isaacson. Uh, he was famous for a lot of reasons in the business world, but he wrote the biography of Steve Jobs that was an, an enormous bestseller, but he wrote a bunch of other ones as well. He's, just, he's a great writer. And he wrote when he wrote the book on Steve Jobs, he was fascinated that there were many other brilliant people besides Steve Jobs that were creative that allowed us to have this digital world that we have. Now, I know there's plenty of downsides to the digital world that we have right now, too, right? So nothing ever comes with only benefits, but it has clearly changed the world. And, you know, I saw him because, you know, when you're running the meeting, you get to talk to the speakers backstage before they go out there. And I also saw him after he gave the talk, which I was really impressed with. And, and I said, if you had to summarize the takeaways, what would it be? And he said, the first thing he said without hesitating was, there's no lone genius. Everybody needs other people to work with him. You have to be part of a team in order. You know, there is always one-offs that do that. But in general, the innovators always were able to build a team around them so that it didn't have to just be them. And, and they, were, they were humble enough to listen to the input from the other people. So let's just think of that as the body of Christ. Right? Forsake not the assembling together with other believers. It doesn't say gather together. It says assemble together. Live life together. Hold each other accountable. Become this new living stone temple. That's what he said. You're each living stones in this new temple that I have for you. And, and the interesting thing is that I'll just give you the bottom line of after you read this book called The Innovators, if you're from this region, you can't help but realize that we could have been Silicon Alley right here, exactly right here, B between New York City, Princeton, and Philadelphia, all the early makings of all the computers were right here, okay? Bell Labs started in New York and then went to Mary Hill, which is not far from here. They invented the chip, right? You had Einstein at Princeton, that's not a bad resource, along with all the millions of other resources they have there. I, I could go down a long list of things. The first computer 
was worst, first operating programmable computer was at UPenn in Philadelphia. But there's just hundreds and hundreds of more of the early signs, <coughs> excuse me, before it actually took off. And you know what stopped it? A religious spirit in the business world. And, and before I ever you know, was thinking about Chuck Pierce saying that we lost something that could have changed the world, I was telling people that. So you really have to be careful because this is not just for church, what we're talking about. This is for life. You want to find favor in the, in the marketplace. Be open to new ideas. Yes, it's, it's risky, but I'll just, again, summarize because I'm here to talk about the Bible, but this is an application in our everyday lives that I'll just give you an example. Okay, so they, uh, the people that make copiers had the, had the first uh, patent Xerox back at the time, they had the first patent for a personal computer, but it was sitting up on a shelf. And one of the executives said, the personal computer will never be more popular than the copier. Okay? That's a lack of vision. That's what happens to us. We get too caught up in our own little world. They had the patent for the mouse, what we call the mouse, right? And it was sitting up on a shelf. And Steve Jobs said, well, can I buy the patent from you? And he said, they said, sure, no problem. Right? Because he had the vision. And I know he was from San Francisco, but look, they would have been coming here if we just had enough sense to have the vision to see what was coming and the impact it would have. And, you know, you ever heard the expression, death by committee in a big corporation? Right? Every time you add another person into the decision-making ranks, there's less and less chance you're going to agree on anything. And what ended up happening, again, summary now, I could go into more details, I won't, was the California culture was more wide open. And, you know, the downside of that was, you know, oh, the summer of love in 67, LSD, you know, at, at every party. It wasn't even illegal until 1967, and they were doing it all throughout the 60s, so there was so much damage. But they had a creativity and an open-mindedness about things. And the people that ran Stanford University had a brilliant idea that they would let these startup companies come and have free space on their campus. And, and for the trade-off of you don't need to spend money on rent, we want part of the copyright on whatever ideas you come up with. Because it's Stanford University. There are a lot of brilliant people teaching there, too. Intel, you know, I could tell you so many of the companies that went there that all just took off, right, because all of that innovation just needed somebody to give an experiment to it, and then really, like, you know, the, the net of it, in my opinion, is positive, that we have all this technology. It can destroy your life if you're not careful, but it's also saved a bunch of lives, amen? So what's, how would this part of the country be different if this was Silicon Valley? How much more prosperity would be here? How many more people that are Christians that could have had the wealth to, to fund more operations in the kingdom? And, and what stopped it was the difference of the old guard not having enough vision to see where the new guard was going, but the cowboys out in California like, sure, we'll do that. And boy, they were right. They were right. So there's something to be learned about that. That you don't, you know, what rigor mortis is? Stiffening of a dead body? But that can happen while you're alive because you just block out, you know, Holy Spirit is, is here to keep your money. We were in, in Arizona with uh, Bishop Bill Hammond. He's 87 years old. There was 2,000 people in the building, uh, you know, in, in the chairs, and the average age was 22. Like, the, you know, they were all young people, tattoos. You know, you could tell a lot of them came out of a really rough life. But, man, let me tell you, they were on fire for God. The worship was an hour and a half long. Right? And here's this 87-year-old guy, and he's going to get up there and talk. Like, what, what possibly could he have in common with them? They loved him because he's a prophet. And the prophet is that scent of water. He was bringing something to them about the power of the shout. Like, talk about a ripe group for the power of the shout. These guys, I, you can watch the video. I'll send you, send you the link if you want. I, it was one of the best services I was ever in because here he is, like, eliminate the generation gap that they were both operating, both generations were operating in the spirit. And when that happens, it's like a Caleb anointing. I didn't lose anything. I'm just as strong now as when the Lord called me, right? It was awesome to see. And, and, and a real, like, you know, a wake-up call, like, you would have assumed one thing. You were wrong, 
right? You would have assumed there would be nothing he could say to them that they would want to listen to. And that was just so wrong. They loved him. All right, so I'm going, wind, I'm going to wind it down a little bit. But I did say, I will finish with scripture, but I like this quote from Steve Jobs because I think if we're not careful, we could lose this. And here he's an unbeliever, heathen, and he had more understanding of scriptural principles in some respects than those chief priests did with Jesus. He said, some people say, give the customers what they want, but that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what they're going to want before they do. I think Henry Ford once said, if I'd asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. <laughs> right? They were in a, a certain paradigm, and they couldn't think outside the horse paradigm. Henry Ford could. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. Man, we could spend a lot of time on that one. So that unsaved person that you're working with, doesn't know Jesus is the answer because the only exposure that unsaved person you're working with was getting dragged to church as a kid and there was no life in there and you know everybody was grumbling and complaining because when Uncle Salvatore died the, the priest charged us five hundred dollars to do the funeral and we were here all those years and you know that's the Italian culture anyway they hold the grudge for hundreds of years it seems my family anyway and and they, they just they didn't have a sense of of life when it came to organized religion. So they wrote it off. They don't think that's even possible, that, that there's any paradigm that could work for the Lord. But we know it's not about church, is it? Even though you're sitting in church right now. It's about a living relationship with a living God. So what if you sit down to them and you see the open door and you start talking to them and you start showing them what they want? They don't know what they want. They don't know there's a personal relationship with a living God that can free them from their addiction to pornography that they're too ashamed to talk about. But he is that God, and he is that power. And that's why he said, that's why I never rely on market research, which is really interesting. I don't think anybody would argue that if he was still alive, he'd be the richest guy in, in the world right now, so he clearly knew how to run a successful business. <clears throat> the market research for us is the conventional wisdom, right? You've got to be willing to think outside the box of the conventional wisdom. And if you ever got a bunch of pastors together at a meeting, their biggest complaint would be when they go with a new idea to their board, this is what they hear. We haven't done it that way before, right? Death by committee. Can't do that in the business world. If you don't innovate in the business world, you're out of business. Amazon wiped out a bunch of people during COVID, right? Because they just had a better business model. But this last one really gets me. He said, our task is to read things that are not yet on the page. If that doesn't describe the prophetic, I don't know what does. So you're working with somebody and they trust you for whatever reason they trust you. Did you ever have people say at work, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I don't talk about this with anybody. All your heads are nodding. I'm guessing the camera heads are going this way too. Like, yeah, I wonder what that is. What that is is they sense something about you that you're reliable, you, that you can be trusted. You're not going to blab their stuff out there. So they start talking to you, and they're not specifically asking for an answer per se, but this is where that open door and that bid for connection that I started with really comes into play. Because if you'll just stop thinking that you already know the answer while they're talking and just have one ear open to the Lord while they're talking to you saying, I know what I want to say right now, Lord, but what do you want to say to your child that doesn't know they're your child yet? It'll be a different answer, right? It won't be always what you would have wanted to say. And, and I would much rather let him have the glory, right? It doesn't have to be about us having all the right answers all the time. So, you know, I'm still in the workforce, so I've seen dozens and dozens of examples where this approach actually worked. And... Many times, the thing that gives us a religious attitude is our judgments. That we, we meet people and we automatically fill in all the blanks of who they are and what they're about and where they came from and how much education they have. Wrong, 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 wrong. No idea. Don't do it. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Even unsaved, hurting people are fearfully and wonderfully made. And judging them is the fastest way to shut down the conversation. So I'm going to finish with a couple of verses that you guys have heard me talk about before, but 
um, you know, John Wimber's favorite expression, uh, or at least one of the ones I heard a lot was, faith is spelled R-I-S-K, okay? So when you're in that open door moment, you're out on a limb, man. You're, you're out on a wire there, and you feel like you could fall off on either side. It's risky to walk by faith, right? You, know, you don't know how they're going to respond to what you say. And sometimes they don't respond so well, but that's really just because they're testing whether you really mean what, you say, what you're saying. They're just looking for the metal in you. And it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place where he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Like, that's the ultimate faith statement. There's no address to punch in the GPS, and you're still going because you're expecting to find out along the way. That takes faith, but that is risky. I don't think it's ever meant to be any other way than that, living as a Christian. And then a little later in that same chapter, it says, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. That's some faith. Well, look, here's the deal. I was in my 90s when God shows up and tells me I'm going to have a kid, right, or, or that I would have a kid in my 90s. My wife laughed, right, like no way that's going to ever happen with either one of us, right, and then denied laughing about it, right. So, like, the fact that I even have this son, Isaac, is such a miracle that why wouldn't I think if I put him on the altar and brought the knife down that God wouldn't raise him from the dead? Because he came from the dead. I was dead when it comes to reproduction. So now I'm going to all of a sudden I'm going to hang on to all these things I have. Well, no, I can't do this. Wait a minute. You didn't have anything when I met you, God could say. I, I tell you what I had was a whole bunch of nothing and people that wanted to kill me. Wow. Anyway, I won't go there. But this is what we do. Like, we had nothing. We were broken. He takes us out. Then we get a bunch of stuff, and we forget that it's not our stuff. It's his stuff. So what are you holding on to? And that holding on to is the very thing that stops him from being able to use you. That was the priests and the Pharisees. You know, hold on loosely. So let's pray. Come on, let's stand. When we come out, um, one of the things we want to do is pray for people that are here because it's not, it's not good to just hear about it and not act on it, right? So we'll have prayer ministry at the altar if you want prayer. And it could, it could just be as simple as I would like to hear the voice of the Lord more clearly, right? If, if, if somebody laid hands on you and you got filled with the Holy Spirit that way, why couldn't they lay, lay hands on you and, and believe God is going to just lubricate your hearing when it comes to the kingdom, Right? That's what we all want. We all want to know his voice more clearly. And maybe we got to stop doing some things that's making it hard for us to hear his voice. I mean, think about David, right? He shows up at the battlefield, no plans to do anything other than bring food to his brothers. And then there's this huge sliding door moment. Boom. That door just opens wide. And he says, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Like, he can't wait. He ran into that battle because he knew God told him he could do that. Now, that's a pretty well-developed ear, don't you think? No doubt in his mind. There was doubt in Saul's mind, but there was no doubt in David's mind. And then that same guy, David, he gets hijacked emotionally, and he's going ready to kill Nabal because he wouldn't feed his servants. Remember that? David's men. And who's, who interrupts that one? Abigail. Holy Spirit comes and says, David, you sure you want to do this? <laughs> You're about to ruin your, your whole future because you're acting out of your emotional hijacking right now. And God will just do that. So maybe you can lift your hands. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us so much, that you speak to us. But we want to be those sheep that hear your voice, that know your perfect will, and that hold on to things loosely and recognize that that this is our opportunity. We're here now in this season, and this is our opportunity. And, and it's not an endless amount of opportunities that you give us. There's people making bids for connection with us. Help us not to walk past that, but to keep our heart open and then not just automatically fill in the blank with the answer that we think they need, but to wait and listen and hear from you. Because we don't want to miss those sliding door moments, Lord. We want to 
We want to respond to those bids of, for connection that people put out, especially this time of year with the holidays coming and all the pain that's in the culture this year, Lord. The, the harvest is white, and we want to be those laborers, Lord, that, that know how to hear you clearly and are willing to spell faith R-I-S-K and, and be willing to take those risks that don't always feel so comfortable, but it feels so awesome to see people get delivered and set free and saved and, and, and taken out of that bondage of sin. So give us the courage to be those ambassadors, Lord, that are, that are rightly reflecting your character into the culture and into our families. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen.